Welcome, my dear friends, uh, to Royal Pearl ENT University. And uh, you know that Royal Pearl is always towards academics, propagating up academics. And we have a single intention to teach. There is no other intention we have. <laughs> Now, um, you know that Royal Paul University is doing live surgeries almost every day. And you can see that in my channel every day. And uh, I am basically a trained otologist. So many people think that I am a rhinologist. No, I have formally got trained in otology by so many dons in otology. And one of the dons I got trained with is Professor Mahadeveya, sir. And as you all know, I can say that Dr. Mahadeveya, sir, was the father of Indian otology. And now his son, that is Professor Vijendra Honorappa, actually, uh, he calls him, Professor Mahadeveya calls him his son. So uh, he is now the dawn and father of otology. And uh, we learned several things from Dr. Vijendra sir and his techniques, his uh, many, many innovations. And as you all know that uh, Vijaya ENT Center is, uh, ENT Care Center is so famous around the globe. And now his student, Dr. Neelesh Mahajan, and I can say he is his adopted son, or maybe even his son. And uh, he has been working with Dr. Vijendra sir for the past seven long years. And uh, I'm going to tell something about Dr. Neelesh Mahajan, because uh, I have been admiring him for his innovations, his skills, his talking skills the teaching skills, as well as his knowledge, uh, in-depth knowledge on radiology of temple bone. And I'm going to tell his CV in short. In short, if I start telling, that will become a class. So I'm just going to tell it in short. So Dr. Nilesh Mahajan is a consultant in Vijaya ENT Care Center, Bangalore, India. He did his MBBS from BJ Medical College, Pune. His diploma B in ENT from RCSM Government Medical College and CPR Hospital for the poor. He has a fellowship in microwave surgery from Kelly University, Belgium. Now to tell about his accolades, he's a gold medalist for innovative way of reading CD scans of facial nerve in midterm AOICON Mangalore 2017. That's uh, way back, six years back itself, he has been a gold medalist. And he's also the winner of the prestigious RAF Cooper Award in 2018. He's got the gold medal for the best practicing ENT surgeon in AOI Karnataka and South Zone Conference 2018. Uh, attic Retraction Pocket, a new classification system named after the popular uh, duo, I can call the duo now, Vijendra Mahajan classification. What a pride it is to India for attic retraction pockets published in laryngoscope. He's co-authored the largest diagnostic gear atlas and it's, I have read it and it's one of its kind, Autology Demystified. He has several uh, publications in the national and international journals. He is very well known in India for his expertise in radiology of temporal bone and has been invited in zonal, national and many, many teaching institutes. Well, I want to tell something different about him because this is a, a real CV. But my relationship with Dr. Nilesh has been that a very affable person and very humble and respects his teachers. And uh, I think, Doctor, there is no sound. There is somebody saying there is no sound. Can somebody tell whether there is sound or not? Doctor Nilesh, are you hearing me? Yeah, 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 very clear, sir. I am hearing you. Ah, so I think the problem is in the other side. Okay. 
so he is very affable uh, thorough gentleman and uh, and in fact i contacted him during all india and i asked him sir can you do one uh, you know workshop with uh, royal pearl uh, ent university and he said for sure i will do that so the enthusiasm to teach it comes from the heart and here's a gentleman who is going to talk today about ct scan of temporal bone and mri of the temporal bone i'm sure this is going to be a landmark the reference in youtube for any problems related to the ct scan reading and i'm sure the post graduates the consultants anybody will benefit from this and uh, god bless you dr nilesh mahajan i really am proud to say that uh, you know you are an indian and also having the willingness to teach so we will be having a lot of people joining us already I mean, it's almost full the uh, so a very very good afternoon to all of you over to you without much ado dr nilesh mahajan the dais is all yours go ahead thank you very much sir for your kind and wonderful introduction for me so sir we'll start the lecture so during the lecture any time whenever you feel sir you can uh, interrupt me to ask some questions so that we can finish top that point of time only sure yes yeah, sir tell the way how i learned the ct scan myself so that it will be helpful for others to learn Dr. Nilesh, your uh, slide is pixelating and your voice is not heard. Dr. Nilesh, hello. Are you able to hear me, sir? i can hear you but uh, there's some problem in the uh, slides can you restart the slide sharing now sir it's loading sir how is your internet connection uh, it's good sir i am connected to lan okay can you share it again now yeah Can you see, sir, my screen now? Ah, uh, yeah, but it's a little pixelating. I don't know why. What about uh, Satya? Chennai. Hello. Hey, how is the screen? Hello. Can you see the screen very well? Ah, uh, yeah, it's it's seen well. No, but it's a little pixelating, no? Sir, can you change to the next slide, sir? Change to the next slide, please. Now. Even now, it's pixelating a little. Yeah, yes, sir. Little oh. pixelated, sir. It's very pixelated. I think the third slide was better, sir. The third slide was better. Just show, show the third slide, please. I'll just reshare, sir. One minute. Ah, so Dr. Amulya says the text is not clear. How, sir? now we can see only black screen boss ah now it's good now it's good now it's good okay carry on yeah now it's clear now it's clear okay, okay. so sir while i'll be moving the even scan also it yeah. may pixelate or lag behind if anything is there let me know sir i will tell you i will tell you i'll stop you and tell you yes yes so sir we'll uh, begin with the first chapter of this lecture that is the hrct temporal bone it is the essential learning for every otologist 
So as you have already mentioned, my alma mater is BJ Medical College Pune, then RCSM Government Medical College Kolhapur, JN Medical College KL University Belgaum, and the center Vijay ENT Care Center Bangalore I am currently working at. So you know my boss already, Professor Dr. H. Vijendra. He doesn't require any introduction here. Whom I want to introduce is my radiological group. He is Dr. C. R. Ramchandra. He is consultant radiologist in Bangalore. So with going in front of both of them, from whom I learned the radiology of temporal bone, I'll start my lecture. So how to learn HRCT of temporal bone? This is actually, as I told you, it is a story how I learned the radiology of the temporal bone. You have to visit your radiology center frequently and see how the scans are actually taken. You have to sit next to your radiologist and learn how to handle radiology software. Download the OSIRIX or HOROX for Mac systems and Radian Dicom viewer for the Windows. And ask for CD of each scan. And before seeing the films, the radiologist report go through the CD and try to write down what are the abnormal or pathological findings you are able to make out. Then discuss with the radiologist if you are not understanding and sit and see the particular scan with the radiologist in the beginning when you are not well versed with the HRCD temporal board. Because we know if you keep doing practicing something, you'll, one day you will become perfect. It may be 10 days, 100 days or 1000 days, but one day you will be perfect in that thing. So this is the ear, this is the temporal bone and this is the whole body. So our radiologist, what they see is the whole body scan they will be seeing, they will be doing a lot of sonographies, x-rays, CT scan and MRI. So you cannot blame them if they miss some finding in this very small part. See, being otologist or ENT surgeon, if we are not knowing radiology of this part, this small part ourselves, we should not blame our radiological colleagues for not giving us the proper diagnosis. Because if you compare, it is very small part for them. So it is, you can say, almost negligible part for them. They will be uh, doing reporting for abdomen, liver, heart, CNS, brain, everything they will be reporting. So first uh, try to learn the anatomy and radiology of temporal bone ourselves so that we can make them understand what they have missed and so that they will be also perfect in the reporting. So aim of this lecture is to inspire the participants to learn about HRCT temporal bone Everyone should be the master of the HRCT temporal bone and to learn to pick up important points which can help us to improve our surgeries. There is no point in reading only scan if we are not able to apply it for the routine daily surgeries. So no one can teach radiology of the temporal bone. Only wait how to read it can be taught because it is a photographic memory. It is in your hand whether you want to make it short term or long term. Because many times when I give lecture, people will think, oh, it is very simple, we'll do this, that. But later on the next day, they don't follow the scan and then it will become short memory and they will forget it. To make it long-term memory, what you have to do, you have to keep learning scan each and every day unless it becomes long-term forever memory for you. And then you have to imagine 3D anatomy of the temporal bone while looking at the scan. So you can use either direct temporal bones or there are 3D models. Uh, I'll be telling you in my lecture subsequently, there are some 3D models available online freely. So temporal bone anatomy itself is a complex and what makes it more difficult is the radiology of it. And even it becomes more complex because of the plane of the surgery. Because see, here we are operating in the sagittal plane. We always go from lateral to medial side. But the scan, what we are used to talk and uh, got to learn is the all the axial and coronal views. We never see scan in the sagittal view. So that makes it more difficult even. So HRCT temporal bone, there is an importance in the thickness of the scan also. It should be at least 0.6 to 5 mm. Lesser than this, it's not. you are not going to get any more information. But at least it should be 0.6 to 5 mm. 1 mm, 2 mm cuts are not uh, appropriate for HRCT of temporal bone. So the cuts which are taken generally are the axial cuts, which will be reformatted in the coronal cuts and sagittal cuts. There will be some reconstruction and special techniques will be used. So what is our protocol? We always discuss with our radiologists. We have to provide them with the radiological clinical information and endoscopic picture. Nowadays, WhatsApp is uh, very easy to share the images. So we can share the images with them and we can tell them 
this is the pathology what we are seeing on endoscopy and we are looking for this so that it will prevent the under reporting or over reporting so they will not miss anything and they will not miss take any other soft tissue as a cholesteatoma if it is not seen clinically then what are the imaging modality to use we should understand whether the imaging is really necessary or not then in almost all cases hrct of temporal bone that is non contrast is essential then we have to know when to do contrast study we should understand when to do mri and when to do mri with contrast and if you want to use some special type of reconstruction techniques or mr sequences those can be used then three tesla mri all the places it will not be available but it is very essential when you are looking at the endolymphatic hydrosis so when whether the imaging is really necessary or not see there will be some cases which will be acute in onset like aom so aom we never get a scan done unless it is presented with some complication like facial nerve palsy so aom with facial nerve palsy will get scan done but only aom we never get scan done so we have to understand the acute onset cases we don't get the ct imaging done except there is any impending or the case itself presented with the complication then we should know when to do scan exactly we have to should judge the weightage between imaging and the patient generalized condition suppose rta patient has come to you he is having cervical spine fracture sacrum fracture multiple fracture all over body and he has presented with you the acute onset facial nerve palsy presented with the day 5 only so see day 5 you are not going to actively intervene surgically in this case so there is no point of making this patient roam all over the places to get just the ct scan done you can simply wait for two two weeks or three weeks you can see during that time the re uh, recovery natural recovery of the facial nerve and during that time patient will get time to get record from his other injuries so that you can subject him to scan later so you should understand what is the patient's generalized condition and is it absolutely necessary to get scan done then if you have any doubt then better to go with the medical line of treatment instead of directly jumping into the ct scan then the recent onset effusion if you are seeing glue the patient is uh, only complaining of hard of hearing there are no any other complication there is no need of doing any imaging then the granulation tissue also same thing if you can give some acetic acid drops and uh, antibiotics which can resolve this there is no need of getting any ct imaging in this case the active infections only the indication is the osteomyelitis calvus where you are more interested in the bony erosions and the involvement of the skull base the lateral and anterior skull base involvement you want to see so that is the indication for getting imaging done the non contrast hrct we do it almost in all cases and whenever we order some mri i always ask my radiologist sir to give me ct scan also complimentary so that i get to know more anatomical details of the temporal bone and it will be more learning for me so always they give me complimentary ct cuts along with the mri mm. then when to do contrast hrct so when you are suspecting a vascular lesion or you are suspecting the complicated csm case like meningitis or lateral sinus thrombosis then you have to uh push then you have to get contrast like. hrct and osteomyelitis calvus i already told okay, you sir. okay sir Oh, sorry, I got muted. I think so. When to do MRI? So when you are particularly interested in a structure which is not seen properly on the CT scan, see there are two types of lesions of the facial nerve. Either there can be involvement of the facial nerve canal, or there can be lesion of the facial nerve itself. So what we see in CT scan is the facial nerve canal. So whenever you want to see the fallopian canal, we get the HRCT temporal bone. Like we are interested to look at the fallopian canal. in cases of post traumatic facial nerve palsy but if you are looking at the particular lesion of the facial nerve and not for the fallopian canal like the facial nerve schwannomas or tumors of the facial nerve then the investigation we get it done is mri so there is a difference between what structure you are exactly looking at if you are looking at a soft tissue structure which is not more evident on the ct scan 
you have to get MRI done. Then if you are uh, planning for cochlear implant and hearing rehabilitation, MRI is the absolute uh, gold standard. You have to get MRI done. Then if you are interested to see the membranous labyrinth, whether membranous labyrinth is patent or not, then if you are want to see cerebellum bone angle, that is CP angle. So CP angle, there is no bone. So it is a soft tissue structure. So you have to get MRI done to see the CP angle. And lesions, there are certain lesions which can be diagnosed only on the MRI. The CT scan will help you to know the extent and bony destruction due to this uh, soft tissue lesions, but it will not tell you which lesion is it is exactly. So these lesions will be diagnosed only on the MRI, like cholesterol granuloma and the cholesterol which will look like other soft tissue also, which can mimic other soft tissue. So cholesterol can mimic even the granulation tissue or the glue here or some fluid also, but the non-ecoplanar DWI imaging can differentiate it from the other soft tissue lesions. Similarly is the cholesterol granuloma. All of us know that cholesterol granuloma is hyper intense on both T1 and T2. And then there are some special reconstruction techniques you can use for the ossicles, spatial or and cochlea and an MRI. Uh, special sequences we use that non-ecoplanar DWI is for the cholesteatoma, then the cyst sequence and fat separation. So cyst we use to see the cranial nerves more properly. And three Tesla MRI has already told you the only one indication where it is absolutely essential because 1.5 Tesla will not be that much clear when you are suspected Meniere's disease and endolymphatic hydrox where you want to get a delayed contrast study in this patient. So it will be more helpful if you are having three Tesla MRIs. Then how to read the CT scan? See, you have to keep seeing more and more normal scan. Then only you'll be able to identify what is the problem in the given scan if it is a, some pathology is there if you know how normally it looks then you'll be able to see now see you are seeing me you know how normally nilesh looks then if you keep seeing me again and again you'll be knowing that nilesh looks like this but suppose something happens to my nose my face my ear something happens then immediately you'll be able to make out or something has happened to nilesh nose somebody must have bitten him because he has given very bad lecture on hr secret temporal bone so <laughs> like that uh, you have to keep seeing the normal scan so very routinely. Now you will ask oh, where we'll get the normal scan. Suppose whenever you get the uh, unilateral pathology, unilateral cholesterol is there or unilateral some disease is there where the opposite ear is clinically normal. That is the your normal scan which you have got for the comparison to look for the disease. So like this, you have to aggregate all your normal scan and keep them watching again and again so that you can make out what is the problem with the abnormal scan. So these are a few basics how the scan is taken actually. So this is called the anthropological plane, anthropological line, which is infraorbital line which traverses the upper border of the tragus. So this is called anthropological plane and the axial cuts are taken 30 degree to this anthropological plane so it, the cut will be going like something like this as shown here and it will be exactly going parallel to the lateral semicircular canal or horizontal semicircular canal and then coronal cuts will be reformatted perpendicular to exactly this plane so you have to remember this convention that is whatever is the left hand is the right temporal bone and whatever is the right hand is the left temporal bone of the patient. Why it's so? Because we see the scan from foot end of the patient. So if you go to your radiological gantry, you'll be seeing that patient will be sleeping like this and your radiologist or technician will be sitting like this and they'll be seeing scan like this. So patient's entire right side, what happens? It comes to our left side and patient's entire left side is our right hand. That's why when you are seeing this part, this part of the temporal bone, it's a patient's right temporal bone, which is on the left side of the screen. And the part which is on the right side of the screen is patient's left temporal bone. That's why you have to remember this convention always. So then when you open the radiological software, there are a few things you see on the software. Two things you'll be seeing in the bottom here, WL and WW. So WL is nothing but the window length. In simple language, you can tell it as the contrast of the scan. And WW is the window width. It is called the brightness of the scan. With these two values, you can change the appearance of the scan, how it looks. And there will be some information which series you are looking at, and then how much uh, 
current was there in the CT machine and which center it is done and patient's information will be there. And you can see by conventional this side also. Now this is the left temporal bone because it is a single, it is a left temporal bone here because here it's written right and left. This convention also you have to see on the scan. Then how to use radiology software? You have to download it, then you have to install, you have to use trial version. If you are interested, you can purchase it. And then you have to learn the functioning of it. So I use, now I am using the Windows laptop. That's why what I do, I use the Radiant Dicom viewer. So I'll just show you one scale and just open this. So you have to just go to your Dicom folder and just right click, you will get the option open with Radiant Dicom viewer. So just open this. It will take some time to open because the entire scan will be loading in this software. So like this scan will start opening. Just hide the patient data. The entire scan will start opening and here you have to keep watching. It will be loading here slowly. Sometimes it may load fast also. So it doesn't matter. It takes time. So you have to double click whatever sequence you want here in this particular scan. So I want to see right side, then I'll click, double click on the right side. If I want to see left side, I'll double click on the left side. Yeah. So the scan got opened. And as I told you, there are two window length and window width is there. So look at this number. The default number is 102,000. So if you want to change these numbers, you can go to this adjust image window and you can click one left click and then with that you can change window length and window width wherever you want. You can make it dark, you can make it bright, you can make it whatever shade you want, whatever shade you are comfortable with. So and there will be multiple options will be there. You can see it in a default window. So this was the default window generated at the workstation. It was having window length of 100 and window width at 2000. Then there will be full dynamic will be there. Then there will be multiple images will be there, city abdomen. So in city abdomen, city temporal bone will look like this. Then you see city NGO. Then you can see city bone also. Then there is city brain also. Then next is city chest also is there then city lungs. So what is use of this multiple images? There are few multiple images, uh, multiple uses are there of this uh, window settings in even temporal bone. See city abdomen. So abdomen, you can just imagine some guy with a fat belly where his fat is more. So whenever you use this abdominal window, city abdomen window in HR city temporal bone, immediately you will start seeing fat planes very prominently. See there, this is what this is the parotid. So parotid is full of fat so that the parotid is becoming very prominent here. Also, you can use this window if you are not given any uh, soft tissue window generated by the radiological station. Sometimes it happens. Now see in this particular scan, there is no any soft tissue window was generated by the radiology center workstation. Here it was generated, but it is just showing one image. So it is of no use. But if you want to see the fat planes and all, what you can do, you can use the normal window only and just can use the abdominal settings for that particular scan so that you can will be able to see fat planes more. Dr. Nilesh. Yes, sir. Uh, there's a question. What's the ideal uh, window width and window length? Yeah, sir. Right. Ideal, I, it uh, varies from person to person, sir, because it should be smoothing to our eyes. It's not like that. Suppose if you keep like this too much, I am not able to see anything. I am not happy with this window. So what I keep generally, I keep at this setting, sir. I'll show you. I just uh, preset it already. So here is the option of custom window. So you can use that option to preset your, I have preset it ideal. So I keep it at 500 of window length and 5000 of window width. 
so this is smoothing to eyes means it is not very bright also it is not very faint also and it is more easy to make out most of most of the structure which with this ideal window setting so that can be adjusted from here sir here you can go and you can go to custom window and then you can use the preset so you can preset it and just you have to add whatever you want now suppose i want 200 and 2000 so you have to just change this value and you have to put your preset name here here i have kept it 500 and 5000 by myself and then i will save it like this is for nilesh so i will add it and then you press okay button so it will automatically come to your preset windows see here it is come nilesh suppose somebody wants to make some other window like they want 400 and 4500 then go to preset and just add so zoom add here okay and then immediately your window will be changed so like this you can change it with this software sereda logical software and here will be default windows so default windows will be different different like abdominal is 60 w l and 400 ww where fat plans are more clear and there are multiple options then zoom option is there you can zoom your scans then there is a length option is also there suppose if you want to measure some length suppose now we'll come to suppose you want to measure any of the length you just can imagine whatever length you want you can just measure the length from anywhere to anywhere so you have to select this option of length measurement length is there eclipse is there so eclipse is generally used to know the house filled units so you have to calculate the pixels here whatever pixels comes and depending on that you can calculate the house filled units also then there is some option of mpr that is multi panel reconstruction it's called 3d mpr so you can shift your scan to any plane with the use of this 3d mpr let me go to my ideal settings yeah so this is the axial cut now if you, i want to make it coronal cut what i'll do i'll go to coronal settings here taking a little more time to load the scan Dr. Nilesh, are you talking or? Uh... No, 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 sir. It got stuck actually. That's why I'm waiting to open that scan. It's getting open. Yeah, it got open. Because the same scan I'm going to use for showing normal scan also. So I'm waiting this scan to get open. so there are multiple buttons here up you can see so i told you regarding the zoom then length you can measure then you can change the window settings from here 
as well as the 3D MPR where you can change the orientation of your cuts like axial cuts you can make coronal cuts you can make it sagittal cuts or at a time all the three cuts you can see so i'll stop sharing for a few seconds because maybe because of sharing it is taking lot of time to open this scan i'll just open it and reshare Hello. Yes. Ah, yeah, Satya, tell me. Yeah, Satya, tell me. Is it not opening? No, no. Uh, no, no, no. With the uh, sharing, it's not opening. Yeah. Correct. Then we'll sharing. It is taking lot of time, so I'll just open it and then I'll again share it. Okay. okay. Yeah, while sharing, it is taking a lot of time, sir. Now it is getting open very fast without sharing. So just it is showing twenty more seconds to load completely. I'll wait for that time. Is my screen visible, sir? Now? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah. So here is the option of 3D MPR where you can just select it and you can turn your all the scans and you can see them in different plane. Now still it is loading. That's why it does not form completely. Anyway, I'll show you it later also. So this is the axial cut. Here will be your sagittal cut. Here will come your coronal cuts. So with the help of this, you can keep changing your planes of scan with 3d mpr and if you want to do some 3d reconstruction those also you can do so we'll move ahead so these are the some basics of uh, radiology software i wanted to tell and these are the hounsfield units which you can keep in mind when you are seeing at any soft tissue structure because in ct scan it's very difficult to tell what is that soft tissue unless you know the consistency of that content unless you give uh, contrast or unless you do a uh, complementary mri or the subsequent mri in these cases but for grossly you can just remember that bone will be thicker so the hounsfield unit will be more of bone then metals will be even more denser so bone the metals hounsfield unit will be quite large and then as the it uh, the density decreases the hounsfield unit reduces like water is very uh liquid uh, consistency so hounsfield unit of water is just zero so csf will be containing many things like glucose and protein so it will be little more abscess will be containing pus cells so it will be little more then granulation tissue it will be little denser 
so it will be more denser than cholesterol actually so with these things you can just try to find out but these are not always and always true just to keep in mind that metals will be having more denser consistency so that hounsfield units will be more and uh, water type of liquids like water csf and clotted and clotted blood they will be having less hounsfield units so what is our protocol to read the hrct temporal bone so we start reading the hrct temporal bone starting almost from the nasopharynx we see first the nasopharynx then we come to the infratemporal fossa and its muscles then we see the styloid process stylomastoid foramen then we see the mastoid tip then we come to the sinus plate and sigmoid sinus then we see the jugular bulb and jugular foramen then we come to the dural plate we see the internal auditory canal internal carotid canal then we come to the posterior bony metal wall scutum outer otic wall anterior canal wall temporomandibular joint then the middle ear structures like hypo meso and epitympanum ossicles malleus incus and stapes suprastructure we have to see with foot plate then tensor canal eustachian tube orifice we know it has two openings medial will be in the nasopharynx and lateral will be in the ear the middle ear then the inner ear structures like cochlea semicircular canal and vestibule we have to see then internal auditory meatus we have to see petrous apex facial nerve and others like vestibular and cochlear aqueduct so if you see all the structure which you can see in a particular temporal bone ct scan all are included here so when you are starting to learn the hrct temporal bone you should look for all the structure and not just for the important structure where the disease pathology is lying so radiology of the temporal bone it can be imagined and understood only when you know the detailed anatomy of the temporal bone so if you know how particular structure is situated inside the temporal bone then only you can imagine how it will look in the ct scan of the temporal bone so i prefer to read the scans from the lower to upper cuts because most of the centers they print the films in this format and most of the structures are easy to see including the facial nerve when you see from lower to upper cuts but there are few structure which are very very easy if you go from upper to lower cuts that like internal auditory meatus or semicircular canal and even facial nerve if you are able to trace from the internal auditory meatus it is easy to find out so facial nerve anyway you can find out from the stylomastoid foramen also and you can find out from the internal auditory meatus also so as i told you i'll be showing you scan from lower to upper cuts whenever i'll be coming down again from the up i'll be let you know but whatever i am showing i'll be showing most of the cuts from the lower to upper so hrct temporal bone is it a correct nomenclature it's not correct nomenclature because it is a misnomer because it is complete nomenclature there are many many non temporal parts which we see in the hrct temporal bone which mostly we ignore because these parts are less likely to be encountered during the routine ear surgeries but are important in unusual extensions and the lateral bulb based uh, skull based cases so these are the non temporal parts and the proper temporal bone that's why the hrct temporal bone is actually a misnomer it should be called hrct temporal bone and skull base so what are the normal non temporal parts which are seen in the hrct temporal bone so i told you the nasopharynx it is not a part of temporal bone it is seen eustachian tube orifice medial end that is also not part of the temporal bone it is seen sinuses we can see we can see the infra temporal fossa we can see foramen magnum we can see atlas axis vertebrae and you can see the foramen of the skelvis so all these are our non temporal parts which we see and we leisurely ignore them while looking at the ct scan so is a ct scan shows only bone ct scan shows only bone it is also not correct it is best for bone but it shows everything the best example is ct brain so see now brain is not bone still we get ct brain the for the routine primary investigation is ct brain because ct scan shows even soft tissue also so we'll start our seeing the scan from the non temporal parts and the soft tissue structure instead of bones seeing the bones we'll start later first we'll see the soft tissue which are seen in the ct scan that is the eustachian tube orifice medial end then we see the nasopharynx we see the torus tuberis and we see the fossa of rosenmuller so i told you once you know the anatomy then only you can imagine the radiology and correlate it so this is the normal first pass of 
any nasal endoscopic examination we have to go along the floor of the nose nostril and you can see the septum on the right side and the inferior pinnate on the left side so this is the right nostril you can see the eustachian tube orifice here and you can see when patient is swallowing it is nicely opening the eustachian tube orifice is opening so see here oh sorry i double pressed it so i will again go here yeah so see this is the nasopharynx so this is the nasopharyngeal area where you are seeing the eustachian tube orifice and posterior to eustachian tube orifice is the torus tuberis then posterior to tuber torus tuberis deep inside will come your fossa prosomolus and this is the area of the adenoid soft tissue so if you know this much anatomy you have to correlate same thing with the your ct scan so we'll go to that first scan which i opened it is already open here so see already the structures are in place here so you know by the anatomy how to find the eustachian tube orifice so when we were going along the first part we first pass we were going along the inferior turbinate in the floor so this is the inferior turbinate so posterior lateral to inferior turbinate will be our eustachian tube orifice and remember in ct scan none of the structure is 2d all the structures are 3d it is the just the particular plane of the axis where you are seeing this structure in 2d format but all the structures are 3d means they will be present in multiple planes here so like this and i told you this is the inferior turbinate posterior lateral to inferior turbinate will be your eustachian tube orifice so this is the eustachian tube orifice medial end we got it here so if you go down this is also eustachian tube orifice and if you come up this is also eustachian tube orifice means multiple level it will be present so inferior turbinate posterior lateral to it is the eustachian tube orifice posterior to that is the torus tuberis so this is the torus tuberis so same is true about torus tuberis also if you go down this bulge is also torus tuberis and if you come up this bulge is also torus tuberis so multiple plane it will be present because it is a 3d structure it is not 2d structure so the inferior turbinate posterior lateral to that the eustachian tube orifice then posterior to that is the torus tuberis then this is the area of the adenoid soft tissue and in between, between both we get the fossa of rosenmuller so you see here there is some dark area appearing here both the sides i'll just zoom it so see this is the fossa of rosenmuller so all the non temporal parts and soft tissue part these are none of the part is bone here so all the soft tissues are also seen in the ct scan this is hrct of temporal bone nothing more than that so you can see the inferior turbinate you can see the eustachian tube orifice you can see the torus tuberis and you can see the fossa of rosenmuller bilaterally and even you can see the maxillary sinus here so paranasal sinus is also we can see this is the septum then if you come up you will be able to see the middle turbinate also and if you still come higher up you will see the sphenoid sinus even you can see the olfactory foramen here and here will be the area of the olfactory bulb which is more clearly seen in mri and then if you come up this is the area of the forebrain that is called as central gyrus rectus gyrus so so many structures you will be seen in the hrct temporal bone this is actually if you see in toto what is this this is nothing but the hrct temporal bone but what parts we are talking now the olfactory foramen the cribriform plate, plate and then the anterior and posterior ethmoids the sigmoid uh, sinus, the sphenoid sinuses all these are non temporal parts which can be seen even on the hrct temporal bone so the four structure oh, nilesh i am muting everybody you please unmute yourself later oh, mute, mute. oh okay because okay. somebody talking uh, i am unmuted me sir yeah fine so yeah so there are many non temporal parts which are clearly seen in the hrct temporal bone so just to revise just quickly the inferior turbinate then the eustachian tube orifice the torus tuberis 
and then this dark areas inside deep inside for soft rosen muller and here you will come the adenoid so what is the importance of seeing in this area in any intercity temporal bone so if you are having a adhesive otitis media case where you are suspecting eustachian tube obstruction so it can be anatomical or it can be functional also so both cannot be tested clinically so anatomically obstruction you cannot see clinically only functional obstruction you can make out if patient is doing valsalva and air is not coming you can say that there is some uh, functional uh, obstruction of the eustachian tube but if there is any anatomical obstruction of the eustachian tube say in the kid in children there may be some large adenoid tissue which will be covering and blocking the eustachian tube orifice or say in very old man person which is presented with unilateral serous otitis media with frequent episodes of nasal bleed then you can suspect the nasopharyngeal carcinoma in this area so this area becomes very important though it is not related to the temporal bone why means in the cases of adhesive otitis media as well as the nasopharyngeal tumors so you have to be careful while seeing this areas you should rule out all the anatomical obstructions of the eustachian tube orifice when you are looking at particular scan so we saw the eustachian tube orifice nasopharynx torus uh, tuberis and fossa of rosenmuller we'll go next paranasal sinuses is very easy to understand as plane of surgery and scan coincides and uh, that is not a uh, today's talk so paranasal sinuses will skip now then uh, during this lecture i'll be using some online contents i told you there are many free websites are also there so it is for educational and teaching purpose only and not for any commercial benefits in any way so we'll start next with the infratemporal fossa so go to our list where is our list i'll just go back yeah so we saw nasopharyngeal area already we covered next will come the infratemporal fossa in its muscle so come to infratemporal fossa so i told you there are some 3d models are they were available online so i'll show you some of the 3d models which i used to hide this floating panel so muscles of the infratemporal fossa so there is this website it's called sketch fab so in sketch fab you can simply type this name muscles of mastication and you get use this 3d model so this is actually some models are free and some you can purchase also but the what models i'm going to show you all are free of cost no need to purchase this models then you just understand the anatomy you can use this 3d models so i told you you see the scan from the foot end of the patient so imagine the patient is sleeping and you are seeing from the foot end so you'll be seeing scan something like this then i'll just make it full screen i zoom it little okay so you are seeing some four muscles here so these two muscles are attached to the pterygoid plates so here comes our medial pterygoid plate this is the palate then pterygoid plate medial pterygoid plate this is the lateral pterygoid plate this is the mandible the ramus of the mandible and this is the entire skull so you are seeing four structures here actually so the structure which is most medial it is attached to the lateral pterygoid plate it is the medial border of lateral pterygoid plate this muscle is called medial pterygoid then there will be another muscle which is attached from lateral side of this lateral pterygoid plate it is called lateral pterygoid then there will be this big muscle which will be coming from superior part we'll just turn this skull and try to see what is that muscle so this is the masseter muscle so masseter muscle is sitting over the mandibular ramus and then there is another muscle this fourth muscle we'll just turn this skull and we'll see what that muscle is so you can see there is very large muscle so this is the temporalis muscle and it is going somewhere inside here so when it goes inside here ultimately it will come somewhere in this triangular area so if you can make out see there is one muscle is coming here this muscle is only from going inside and it's coming here so these are the so like something like triangle shape it is coming in this area so if you understand this much anatomy of the 
infra temporal fossa that is you have to find out the lateral pterygoid plate medial pterygoid plate then you will see two muscles attached to the lateral pterygoid plate the muscle which is attached from medial side it is the medial pterygoid the muscle which is attached from the lateral side is lateral pterygoid then there will be a muscle which is attached to the ramus of the mandible the body of the mandible from side and there is another muscle which is coming in the triangular area somewhere here here in the triangular shape it is coming here if this much an anatomy you understand same thing you have to look at your scan so see i not moved scan we are correctly came to the area which you want to see here so i'll just change it to abdominal window so that the muscles will become more prominent here because fat planes are become prominent here so we were already in the nasopharynx we saw the inferior turbinate we saw the eustachian tube orifice we saw the torus tuberis and we saw the fossa frozen muscle so same level you are already seeing the medial and lateral pterygoid plate so this is the medial pterygoid plate this is the lateral pterygoid plate so we saw by the anatomy the muscle which is attached medial part is the medial pterygoid the muscle which is attached laterally is the lateral pterygoid and then there was a very big muscle which is over the this body of the mandible so this is the masseter and we saw one more muscle which is coming from superior part and forming some triangular insertion in this area so this is the temporalis muscle so finish this is the infratemporal muscle and muscles of mastication that is the medial pterygoid which is attached on the medial aspect of the lateral pterygoid plate this is the lateral pterygoid muscle which is attached lateral to the lateral pterygoid plate so l l l means lateral pterygoid attached to the lateral border of lateral pterygoid plate and this is l l m so lateral pterygoid plate l m m medial part medial pterygoid muscle and then this is the temporalis muscle and this is the masseter muscle so what is importance of seeing this muscles in hrct temporal bone so infra temporal fossa is generally involved in the cases of skull base osteomyelitis so what happens in the skull base osteomyelitis the infection which is in the most of the time in the middle ear mastoid and the floor of the extraauditory canal so this is the floor of the extraauditory canal through the tympanic bone it will go anteriorly and it will come in the area of the infra temporal fossa so once infection comes here what happens this muscles they will start increase in size because inflammation means what there is a uh, this muscles will get inflamed inflamed means they will increase in the size the swelling will come over this muscle so automatically what will happen there is only one structure to get compressed in this area see muscle cannot compress this bones muscle cannot compress other muscle so who is the uh, who is the victim here the fat planes so what will happen if muscle get increase in the size this fat plane will start obstructing so fat plane will decrease in the size so this is the fat plane so bilaterally here symmetrical so we can say there is no disease in the infra temporal fossa it will start obliterating suppose this lateral pterygoid muscle is in plane this muscle will expand here and it will block this fat plane so these are the fat planes and you can see in the ct abdomen window here you can see fat a lot of fat in the bilateral parotid and even subcutaneous tissue fat also you can make out if radiology center has not given you soft tissue window most of the time they will give but sometimes if they have not given you can simply use abdominal window to convert your scan and see for the fat plane so this is regarding the infra temporal fossa we'll go to next so muscles we saw and we saw the importance of fat plane in infra temporal fossa so again this is the same image where the infra temporal fossa is seen so this is the medial pterygoid plate lateral pterygoid plate then soft tissue window for the infra temporal fossa so i told you if radiological center is giving you soft tissue window so that is the best so i'll just see whether in this scan they have given the soft tissue window my scan may take some time to open because my hard disk is uh, full of scan plus uh, somehow while i'm using this zoom the loading has become very slow so here you can see they have given the soft tissue window already so you can see nicely the medial pterygoid plate lateral pterygoid plate 
the medial medial pterygoid muscle the lateral pterygoid muscle the temporalis muscle and the masseter muscle and you can see the parotid very nicely here so superficial lobe deep lobe of the parotid and fat planes are seen nicely so this is the soft tissue window which is already given by the radiological center because you can change the window settings but you cannot change the actual window for which it is made like if it is made for city abdomen you can just make it white or dark you cannot change the window this was the soft tissue consistency of this screen so now this is soft tissue window the default window is in soft tissue you go to whichever window it will always look like something like the original scan only you see i did now abdominal still it is looking same i made it bone still it is looking little same ct chest also it is looking same so this is the soft tissue window which is generated at the radiological center so whenever it is given it's well and good if not given you can just use abdominal window in any plain bone window so next is foramen of skull so here i'll be telling uh, shortly if in the end time permits i'll come back to this again because this is very complicated it should be taken in the end but it is a part of skull base that's why i'm taking in the beginning also so we saw in the cribriform plate already there are multiple foramena which is called the olfactory foramena then the most important foramen and easily identifiable foramen is the foramen oval then posterior lateral to it is the foramen spinosum and medial to both of these is the foramen lacerum then in the superior part you will see the foramen rotundum and if you go down you will get the median canal so median canal will be down and foramen rotundum will be up and then this is the biggest foramen of the skull that is the foramen magnum here will be the clivus so this is little complicated part so i'll just show the scan and in the end i'll if required i'll come back again to this so let this open i'll go to default window again so i told you most easy to identify is the foramen oval so here foramen oval is already coming into the picture then posterior lateral to foramen oval will be foramen spinosum so i have to just go little up and down to find out the exact positions of the foramena so this is the foramen oval this is foramen oval area you to come up you can see it's a complete oval shape then posterior lateral to it will be the foramen spinosum and we saw in the image exactly medial to it will be the foramen lacerum so this is the area of the <coughs> foramen lacerum then this is foramen rotundum and exactly parallel and lower level but little cylinder foramen will be there that is will be the your median canal so this is the median canal median canal and when you come up this is the foramen rotundum so this relationship we are always getting to see in the ct pns also always when you are dealing with the sphenoid lesions so what you can do you can just go to coronal cuts of this and then just go in the sphenoid sinus and you can see again <clears throat> both foramen are here so this is the median canal and this is the <clears throat> foramen rotundum so if both are matching or not how you can check you can go to 3d mpr then go in the axial cut <clears throat> and keep your arrow over this is foramen rotundum so just keep your axis over the foramen rotundum then double click and go to your coronal cut just zoom it so see this is the foramen rotundum now you want to check whether this is median canal or not so just bring your both the axis in the median canal and go to your axial cut so this is axial cut just zoom it
so here was that axis coming so this is the median canal so you can see the median canal and if you come up you can see the foramen rotundum also so this is a little bit complicated because it is more clearly seen from the anterior skull base so from uh, lateral skull base and to see the axial scan it is little complicated so to just be aware of this uh, foramen of skulls i showed you that so foramen of skull we saw we saw foramen rotundum we saw foramen oval we saw foramen spinosum we saw foramen lacerum and we in the beginning i already show the after uh, this one olfactory foramen then comes the actual temporal bone now it will start the actual temporal bone till now we were seeing the soft tissue in the nasopharynx parapharyngeal space infratemporal fossa and we saw some bones which are not related directly to the temporal bone we saw some the anterior skull base foramen and lateral skull base foramen so now we will come properly to the uh temporal bone the most i told you i prefer to read scan from the bottom of the scan to the top level of the scan so the most bottom most structure comes is the styloid process so here you can use one this 3d model so this is work is done i will just close it so this is the 3d model of temporal bone again so this is also free uh, i think it is named temporal bone and uh, skull base something yeah temporal bone and deep structures so you have to type in this sketch pad this is also free of cost then this is the temporal bone so you can rotate it however you want so this is the lateral aspect of the temporal bone and as i told you the lower most part of the temporal bone is the styloid process so here is the styloid process so why to look for styloid process in the ct scan of temporal bone i'll tell you styloid process is a very good landmark to identify the facial nerve so you can see here one structure is coming out this is the styloid process and immediately posterior lateral to that is the stylomastoid foramen so facial nerve is coming out of from that and then posterior lateral to that is the mastoid tip so if you want to find facial nerve near stylomastoid foramen styloid process is a very good landmark if you are able to find out the styloid process you have to just stress it to its base and once you reach to its base you will get the stylomastoid foramen and if you see this area carefully the styloid process and this is the mastoid tip so this is the out this is the styloid process and this is the mastoid process of the temporal bone in between there is only one foramen you get only opening in the bone will be the stylomastoid foramen and only one soft tissue comes out from there is the facial nerve so if you want to find out facial nerve there are two ways either you can trace this styloid process to its base or what you can do this styloid process and mastoid bone both you have to start tracing simultaneously of both will meet at the junction of the stylomastoid foramen so this much anatomy if you are knowing already same thing you have to going to apply in your scan yeah so we'll go down again so we were we have seen the area of the nasopharynx we have seen the muscles of the see now this is the default window why i want i was asking you to use the abdominal window to see infratemporal fossa see in default window the differentiation of the soft tissue plane and this uh, grayish areas of the fat plane it is not that much prominent but if you shift to abdominal window immediately that differentiation comes so it is easy to find out the defect in these parts that's why you can use abdominal window or straight away if radiological center has provided you soft tissue window you can use this then we'll proceed into my ideal settings so when we are looking at this area we are already seeing the lower most part of the temporal bone uh this 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 part is the axis vertebra and this is the odontoid process of axis vertebra so this is the atlas sorry i said axis i think this is the atlas vertebra and this is the odontoid process of the axis so 
when we are looking at this area your styloid process is already coming into the picture so i'll bring it in center and we'll concentrate on one side only i'll just zoom it little so this is the styloid process so what you have to do you have to keep your cursor on styloid process and just keep coming up so i'm just coming up you can see the styloid process nicely now come up come up it will bring you to the stylomaster foramen automatically so this is nothing but the stylomaster foramen so this is the importance of seeing styloid process in any ct scan so once you get this type of structure in suppose in printed film also you are getting this type of dot that is the styloid process you just keep pressing it in subsequent cuts so that it will lead you to the stylomaster foramen and once you get stylomaster foramen entire facial nerve you can press wherever you want till the this is vertical segment vertical segment then the second genu then the horizontal segment and then it goes the labyrinthine segment and internal matters anyway for facial nerve i'll come back again the point here is to make the importance of the styloid process that is if you press the styloid process at its base it leads you to the stylomaster foramen second thing we saw we can do what we can press the styloid process and this master tip pair cells simultaneously so i'll still come higher up you can see the master tip pair cells coming into the picture so between these two there is only one round structure or oval type of structure will be there that is the stylomaster foramen so you just keep converging these two type two uh, structures the till the styloid process and master tip just keep coming up and both will merge at the stylomaster foramen so in these two ways you can find out the stylomaster foramen and once you get stylomaster foramen you can stress the entire facial nerve so that is the importance of knowing the stylomaster uh, styloid process in the temporal bone which is the lowermost part of the temporal bone next we will see the sigmoid sinus jugular bulb jugular foramen internal carotid artery and i'll just grossly tell you when to say anterior place or low lying tegment and the high jugular bulb so come back to this scan first we'll see the 3d anatomy how it looks actually so if you know how would the sigmoid sinus is formed so this is picture from radiopedia so here is the transverse sinus which comes posteriorly then this transverse sinus will get converted into the sigmoid sinus which will further go down and then when it is going down it will form a bulge which is called a jugular bulb and later it will be continuing as a internal jugular vein in the neck so transverse sinus will come from the posterior part then it will become the sigmoid sinus then it will turn sigmoid turn and it will form a bulge it is the jugular bulb and then it will go in neck at ijv so this much anatomy if you know the same thing you have to apply in your temporal bone so here also you can see already here is the sigmoid sinus transverse sinus is not there because it will be in the occipital part so this is the sigmoid sinus the sigmoid sinus is going down then it is forming a bulb here and then later it forms the internal jugular vein in the neck so immediately anterior to that will be the internal carotid artery this is internal carotid artery here this is the internal jugular vein and when these two things are there in the jugular foramen so this part will be called jugular bulb and this part will be called the internal carotid artery the bone between them is called crotch or it is also called as jugulo carotico septum so this bone in between two is jugulo carotico septum this is jugular bulb this is the internal carotid artery if you go down the level of the jugular foramen it will become ijv the jugular bulb will continue as the ijv the internal carotid artery will remain same so if you know this much anatomy you have to apply it in the radiology so as we are seeing for the sigmoid sinus sigmoid sinus is a soft tissue structure it is not bone what we see is a sigmoid sinus plate actually what we see 
so we saw here from posteriorly will come our transverse sinus so if you give contrast you can identify it more easily we'll just see one contrast scan So this is contrast scan. So I'll go up to find out the transverse sinus. So here comes the transverse sinus. Still loading. By the time I will show you in the normal scan only. So here comes the transverse sinus. Then the transverse sinus will form the sigmoid sinus later. So this is the sigmoid sinus forming here. If you keep tracing the same thing down. Now we are going down. Then it will form a bulb, the jugular bulb. See here the bulb is coming into the picture. And if you still further go down, you'll get a partition bone between the internal carotid artery and the jugular bulb. So this is the roughly area of the jugular foramen because the once this bone between two disappears, it will become the jugular foramen. So this is the jugular foramen. Here you can see the internal carotid artery and this is the jugular bulb. If you still further go down, this will become the internal jugular vein and artery will be remain artery. So when you are coming up, you see the bone between two, it's called crotch or jugulocarotico septum. Plus there will be one more partition in this jugular foramen area. You can see this small bony partition is there. It divides the jugular foramen into two parts. The anterior part is the pars nervosa where our lower cranial nerves will lie. This is called the pars nervosa and the posterior bigger part where the vein is lying properly. It is called pars venosa. So this is the pars venosa. This is the pars nervosa. The bone in between the jugular bulb and internal carotid artery is called as crotch, which will be destroyed in cases of tumors of jugular foramen. More commonly, the paraganglomas of the jugular foramen. It is called Phelps sign. Or sometimes you get more in appearance of this area in the jugular foramen in cases of paragangliomas involving this here. And then here from here it comes the inferior petrosal vein. Inferior petrosal sinus will come here. This is the inferior petrosal channel for the sinus. So inferior petrosal sinus, pars nervosa, pars venosa, the sigmoid sinus here and the internal carotid artery anteriorly. I'll just see that scan whether it is loaded or not. So I think it's loaded. We bring it in center. So here you are seeing transverse sinus already. So this is transverse sinus. Just keep pressing it down. This is transverse sinus. We'll trace it down. So this is forming now the sigmoid sinus here. It has formed sigmoid sinus. Then keep pressing the sigmoid sinus down. This is sigmoid sinus. If you keep pressing it down, it will form the jugular bulb. So sigmoid sinus is forming jugular bulb here. And then anterior to the bulb was, see this is the jugular bulb and anterior to it was the internal carotid artery. So this is the internal carotid artery here. We are already in the neck now because there is no bony partition between the internal carotid artery and the IJV. So this is the internal jugular vein. This is the internal carotid artery. And if you come up in the jugular foramen, those will be separated by this bone. It is called crotch. So this will become the jugular bulb. So if you trace the bulb up, 
this is the sigma sinus and if you trace the sigma sinus up it will ultimately go to the transverse sinus so this is the transverse sinus so like this in contrast scan it is more evident so when to call it as anteriorly placed sinus i'll be coming to that in the next part also but here if you try to see grossly both the sides if you compare just try to compare this side this is the left temporal bone the right side of the scan is the left temporal bone you can see along the all along the petrous part of temporal bone posterior border and the posterior fossa dura if you try to draw a line this sinus is falling within this line if you try to draw same line this side also all along the posterior margin of petrous bone and then the posterior fossa dura what is happening this sinus is projecting anterior to it so this is called the anterior place sinus and what is laterally placed sinus you have to see the distance between outer mastoid cortex and this sinus means this distance you have to see whether it is adequate or not now here lot of air cells are there here also lot of air cells are there means this is anteriorly placed sinus but not laterally placed so this is only anteriorly placed sinus so like this you can tell it is anteriorly placed or not and even if you try to see grossly if i ask you now which sinus you are feeling it is more prominent than anteriorly placed so visually also you can make out this is more anteriorly placed than this this is absolutely flat sinus so i'll come to that later once again then next comes the ossicular chain before ossicular chain we'll just finish the open that normal scan once again before we come to ossicles we'll just see the floor of the external auditory canal the roof of external auditory canal the anterior canal wall and the posterior canal wall then we can go to ossicles so scan is loading and waiting scan to load completely In mistake i close that scan i wouldn't have shouldn't have done because again it is taking time to open so anyway here you are already seeing the anterior canal wall and the posterior canal wall so posterior canal wall is nothing but the anterior margin of our mastoid air cell system and anterior canal wall is the posterior margin of the our temporomandibular joint and this is the external auditory canal so anterior canal wall and the posterior canal wall if you try to merge it inferiorly will reach the floor of the external auditory canal so here you can see the anterior canal wall and the posterior canal wall if you go down what will happen both will merge and both will form the floor of the external auditory canal so both are merging here you can see now this is the floor of the external auditory canal and floor of the external auditory canal continues with the tympanic plate it's called the tympanic plate so this is the area of the tympanic plate and if you trace it further down ultimately will come the stigoid process 
because if you see that 3d model once again see this is the floor of the external auditory canal this is the tympanic bone down and then the stylomaster the styloid process dr nilesh yes sir i am muting everybody again you have to unmute yes yes mute on okay yeah so the anterior posterior canal wall if you merge it inferiorly it forms the floor of the external auditory canal floor continues with the tympanic bone and then inferiorly it will with a styloid process yes then similarly if you come up they will merge at the outer atic wall that is called the root so if you merge the anterior posterior canal wall they will meet at the outer atic wall so this is the outer atic wall or scutum so scutum will be seen like this in the axial cut this is the scutum or outer atic wall so by definition the anterior posterior canal wall when meet in the roof that is the roof of the external auditory canal and the medial most part is called the scutum so scutum we generally see more prominently in the coronal cuts but you should know in the axial cut also how the scutum looks so if you want to confirm whether this is scutum or not that we call the beak like appearance of the scutum what you can do you can just go to 3d mpr then come in the axial cut bring your planes to scutum and then go to coronal cut go to coronal cut so you can see here that is that beak of the scutum already our planes are there only so this is blunted in the cases of retraction pocket or cholesteatoma it will erode or any pathologies which is involving the attic it can erode this scutum so scutum looks like this very familiar to us looks like this in the coronal cuts but you should know how it looks in the say, uh, axial cut also so this is the axial cut how scutum looks so it will be just the medial part of the merging of anterior and posterior canal wall so this is the anterior canal wall this is the posterior canal wall if you go still higher you will go in the mastoid aerosol system if you go down the anterior and posterior canal wall will separate so at the exact junction of that will be the scutum so this is the normal case actually hence the scutum is entirely intact in this case So this is the scutum. So we saw the tympan will come from again styloid process. So this is the styloid process. This is the tympanic bone. Then lowermost part will be the floor of the external auditory canal. The uppermost part of the tympanic bone will be the floor of external auditory canal. Then the posterior canal wall and the anterior canal wall. and then in the roof you will get the scutum then next we will come to the ossicular chain yeah so this is the ossicular chain how it looks like so what happens the cuts will be going from lower parts to upper parts so what happen when you go from the lower most cut first you will see the tip of handle of malleus it will be something like round then when you go up you will start seeing this stick like structure that is the handle of malleus then if you still further go up you will see another round which will be smaller than head and which will not be in continuation with the incus because if head is there you should be able to see the part of incus also if it is non disease here means any of the ossicle is not eroded normal ossicular chain when you see the head part of malleus you should be able to see the body of incus also if you are seeing any other round which is not associated with incus that is the neck of malleus so you'll see the neck of malleus and then finally you'll see another round that is the head of the malleus 
So once you get the head of the malice, you can trace the body of the incus and short process of incus. Then you have to again come down to trace the long process of the incus. You'll see the long process of incus. Then you'll get to see the IL joint, that is the incudostapedal joint, which is formed by the lenticular process of incus and stapes head. And then if you further go down, you'll miss the stapes because of the anatomical orientation, stapes is situated higher up. So to see the stapes, again, you have to go up. So <coughs> to trace the ossicular chain entirely, you have to go up and down two, three times. So first you'll get the tip of handle of malleus, then you'll get handle of malleus, neck of malleus, head of malleus, body of incus, short process of incus, long process of incus, then again go up to see the stapes. So we'll see 3D model of this. So ossicles, all of us can imagine. This is how ossicles will be there. So same figure what I shown you. Cuts will be going like this from down. So first you'll get the tip of handle of malleus, then you'll get the handle of malleus, then will come the neck of malleus, then head of malleus, the body of incus, short process of incus, long process of incus, incudostapedal joint, and then the stapes superstructure with the foot plate, anterior and posterior crust. Same thing you have to trace in your scan. So I'll just zoom it now because we want to see ossicles. So I'll go down in the scan. I'll keep it at city bone only because we want to see bone. Otherwise, I would have kept it in, in the ideal this one, but we'll keep it at bone only so that bones are more prominently seen here. So I'll come up. If you want to see the tympanic membrane proper, which is very thin, there should be air both the sides of the tympanic membrane. Oh, then only the tympanic membrane will be seen. Now, here in the bone window, it's impossible to see the tympanic membrane. So if you go to ideal setting, slightly it will be seen better. So here you can see the tympanic membrane, slight gray line is there. You can make it more white or you can change the window settings to look at it if anything is seen. So it's a very thin gray line is seen here. That is the tympanic membrane. If tympanic membrane is thickened with myringosclerosis, it's easy to identify the tympanic membrane. But normal tympanic membrane will be very, very thin very difficult to see on the CT scan. So I will again change to bone settings. Then we have to find out the tip of handle of malleus now. So we will try to find out some dot in this aerated area. So I am coming up now. You can see there is an appearance of one dot. So after a dot there should come the handle of malleus. So this is the handle of malleus here coming into the picture. Then once you go still higher up, I told you neck of malleus will come. It will be the round structure. Why it is not head? Because it is not accompanied with the body of the incus. See, there is no body of the incus. There is, and this is the non-decided ear actually, normal ear. So this is the round is the neck of the malleus. If you still further come up, you will get the head of malleus. But head of malleus will be always accompanied by the body of the incus. So see the part of body of incus also is coming. And then when you come proper epitympanum, you'll come to see our typical ice cream cone appearance. So where ice cream is head of malleus and cone is the body of incus along with the short process of incus. So this is the figure of eight appearance formed by the epitympanum and the antrum. So two, uh, two things here, ice cream cone appearance and figure out eight appearance. So ice cream cone is formed by Ice cream is malleus head and cone is body of incus, short process of incus. And figure eight of eight appearances, epitympanum along with the antrum, antrum air cell. So this forms the typical figure out eight appearance. So once you get the head of malleus, you can still stress it up. So this is the head of malleus. And when you see the head of malleus, you have to see this is the tegment plate. This is the tegment plate in the axial cut. If you go to again your 3D MPR to confirm whether it is tegment plate or not, go to axial cut. 
and this is i am telling you this is the tendon plate for the head of malleus so keep your planes the axis on this and go and check in coronal so come to coronal this is the coronal so zoom it get in center see this this is nothing but the tendon plate so this is the tendon plate the arrow where it was kept it was the tendon plate so even on the axial cut you can see the tendon plate this is the tendon plate so you have to look for whether there is any fixation between the malleus head and tendon plate or not sometimes you may get the bony ankylosis fixing in this area or tympano sclerosis very commonly which can fix the head of the malleus to the tendon plate so this is the head of malleus so once you see the malleus in entire length we go down again you will see round dot dot is the tip of handle of malleus come up stick like structure is the handle of malleus one round first round is the neck of malleus and second round structure accompanying by the incus is the head of the malleus so once you get head of the malleus according to that image so we trace like this the tip of handle of malleus handle of malleus neck and then head of malleus once you get head of malleus trace the body of incus short process of incus long process of incus same thing we are going to do in this scan so we already got the body of incus and the short process of incus so we'll trace it down so now i am going down i am going down see here this long process is expanding and it's coming down it's coming down and it's coming down and it's coming down so here you are seeing some two dots now let me click in more just make it into white So here you are seeing two dots so these are called two dot sign where the lateral dot is the long process of incus the medial dot is the head of the stapes so when these two will merge with each other that will form your incado stapedial joint and if instead of merging in the next cut if some structure is disappearing that is the indication that that part is necros suppose this lateral dot is disappearing means the lenticular process of incus is necros suppose this medial part medial dot is disappearing that means the stapes head is necrosing or a stapes head is absent so now we'll see whether these two dots will merge with each other or not so i'm going down just one cut you can see here both the dots are merging with each other so both the dots merge with each other means your eye joint is intact see both are merging together the eye joint is intact both have merged eye joint intact according to this image see we are coming from up to down and we saw the lenticular process of incus and stapes head both merged together here now if you keep going down further what will happen you will miss the stapes because anatomical orientation of stapes is something like this to see the stapes you have to go up in the scan again so same thing we are still here so if you go still down see you will not able to see the stapes because stapes is not down it should be up so again come back to this so this is our incado stapedial joint and just keep watching this area when you are going up to look for stapes now to see stapes stapes is a very thin structure you can say it is uh, the thinnest bone in the body so it's very difficult to find out the crust of the stapes if you see in very high highly dense windows so still here you can make out the posterior crust nicely but anterior crust is not seen in this particular bone window that doesn't mean that anterior crust is necros here because stapes is the only structure about which we should always take it uh, we should always make it point either you are able to see it on ct scan or you are not able to see on ct scan you have to always take that surgically it may be present because sometimes stapes may be so much thin that your ct scan is not able to show you that structure so posterior crust here is already seen so what you can do you can just change the window you can just increase 
and you can even see the anterior crust part also here so this is the posterior crust this is the anterior crust and this is the foot plate and then head we have already seen which was along the is joint i'll change to bone window again so if you are seeing in bone window you are not able to see the step is superstructure if you change window you will be able to see it partially not exactly completely so this is the anterior crust of the step is the posterior crust of the step is and then if you further go down you will see the head of the step is also and then the eye is joint same thing what you are seeing in this image you saw the anterior crust you saw the posterior crust and if you go down you will see the head of the step is along with the eye joint and foot plate will be always seen there so this is regarding the ossicular chain malleus cincus and step is all three ossicles we saw then we'll go to the facial nerve so facial nerve already i told you it's so easy to trace from stylomastoid foramen if you are knowing that how to use the styloid process that is the one way of tracing the facial nerve from bottom to top so we'll see in this 3d model again this yes so this is the facial nerve so we'll see the vertical segment where is the vertical segment of facial nerve yeah so this is the vertical segment of the facial nerve this is the corda tympani just before exit in the stylomastoid foramen so vertical segment then you get the second genu second genu of the facial nerve then the horizontal segment of the facial nerve then you get the geniculate ganglion the bulge in the facial nerve then you get the first genu of the facial nerve from where you will get the gsp n also greater superficial petrosal nerve then you will get the labyrinthine segment in relation with the cochlea so this is the labyrinthine segment and then comes your the interauditory meatus in interauditory meatus the facial nerve will be the antero superior so this is the anterior part and this is superior part so antero superior will be facial nerve cochlear nerve will be antero inferior so this is antero inferior cochlear nerve then postero superior will be postero superiorly will be the superior vestibular nerve and postero inferiorly will be the inferior vestibular nerve so this much anatomy if you know same thing you have to press in the scan so we'll go to the styloid process to take help of the styloid process to press the facial nerve so this is the styloid process i am pressing it up so it leads us to the stylomastoid foramen so styloid process find out its base it leads us to the stylomastoid foramen and once you get the stylomastoid foramen just keep pressing it so i'll keep my arrow there over stylomastoid foramen and pressing it up this is the vertical segment of the facial nerve vertical segment vertical segment wherever it moves you have to move your arrow along with that see vertical segment vertical segment and here at this particular level you are seeing one pyramidal type of structure triangular structure medial to that facial nerve which you was pressing till this time so there is another structure which is triangular medial to the facial nerve so this is nothing but your stapedius muscle so this is stapedius muscle this is the pyramid pyramid stapedius muscle so posterior lateral to pyramid will be the second genu of the facial nerve so this is the second genu of the facial nerve we are reached till the second genu you can just till keep pressing it up so i am pressing the facial nerve only <clears throat> then you get the horizontal segment of the facial nerve this is the horizontal segment of the facial nerve and beyond the horizontal segment you get bulge in the facial nerve you just bring it in center so this is the horizontal segment come up you are seeing slight bulge in the facial nerve here 
So this is nothing but the geniculate ganglion area. So if you see, this is the bulge in the facial nerve, geniculate ganglion. If you still come up, you will get the first geni of the facial nerve. It is taking acute turn here. So this is the first geni of the facial nerve. It is entering inside the internal auditory meatus by the labyrinthine segment. This is the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve, which is in close approximation with the cochlear turn. So this is the labyrinthine segment to still come up that will ultimately enter inside the internal auditory meatus. So trace the facial nerve from down to up. We went to find the styloid process. We came up, we found out the styloid foramen, stylomastoid foramen, and then we kept tracing it up. This is all entire thing is vertical segment of the facial nerve. Once we reached the level where there was a pyramid medially, this is the pyramid medially, that is the second geno of the facial nerve. Still, we kept it tracing up. We got the horizontal segment of the facial nerve. Then we got bulge in the facial nerve, which is the geniculate ganglion. Then we came higher up where the labyrinthine segment was close relation with the cochlear turn and ultimately it reached to the internal auditory meatus. So this is the one way to trace the facial nerve. What is other way to trace? So we trace facial nerve from bottom to top. You can trace it from top to bottom also. How to trace top to bottom? Again, come to this model. See, this is the internal auditory meatus. So facial nerve will come out as a labyrinthine segment, which will be in the close approximation of cochlear turn. Then it will take sudden acute turn to form the first genu. Then there is a bulge in the facial nerve that is geniculate ganglion. Then it will find, it will form the horizontal segment of the facial nerve. Then it will take another turn to become vertical. That is the second genu area. And then it will go down as a vertical segment, ultimately to the stylomastoid foramen. <clears throat> Same thing you have to search here. First, you have to search the internal auditory matters. So, internal auditory matters, if you see uh, by anatomically, it is just extension from the posterior fossa dura towards the otic capsule. So, <clears throat> there are three connections between the posterior fossa dura and the otic capsule. First is biggest communication is the internal auditory matters. Second one is the smallest one, it is the cochlear aqueduct. And third is the reverse communication, means something comes out of otic capsule and goes inside the posterior fossa dura. That is the vestibular aqueduct. So there are only these three connections the, between the posterior fossa dura and the otic capsule. So the first and big communication is the interauditory matter. So here you can see the interauditory matter is already coming into the picture. Then we saw the labyrinthine segment. This is the labyrinthine segment, which is in relation with the close relation with the turn of the cochlea, then when you go down, it will form the first genu and anteriorly one nerve will go inside the middle fossa dura, that is the GSPN, this is the canal for GSPN, then this is the geniculate ganglion area, because you can make out surely that this is a bulge in the facial nerve, so this bulge is nothing but the geniculate ganglion, then trace it down, this is the horizontal segment of the facial nerve. You still come down, you will get structure which is posterior lateral to pyramid. So, this is the second gen of the facial nerve. You still go down, still go down. This is the vertical segment of the facial nerve, and ultimately, you will reach to the stylomastoid foramen and then in neck, from where you cannot trace the facial nerve on intercity temporal bone. So, these are the two ways to find out the facial nerve. Then we saw in the this 3D model that antero superiorly was the facial nerve. So there is another nerve which is antero inferior. It is the inside going. It is going inside the cochlea. So this is nothing but the cochlear nerve. There will be another two nerves posterior to these two nerves. So one will be superior that is superior vestibular nerve. Another will be inferior that is inferior vestibular nerve. So same thing we will see in the scan. See, this is the anterior superior is the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve. Posterior superior is the vestibular, superior vestibular nerve. Then if you further go down, again you will see two nerves. This is the cochlear nerve. 
and then this is the inferior vestibular nerve because of the angulation inferior vestibular nerve will not be seen that much clearly and there will be one offshoot from the inferior margin of the inferior vestibular nerve which goes and supply the ampullary end of the posterior semicircular canal so this is the posterior semicircular canal ampullary end so there is a offshoot here this offshoot is not that much clearly seen in the scan so here i use uh, my own technique i use the negative scan here uh, that's what i presented in the 2018 in uh, medio ipon where i got gold medal for this so what i do i reverse the images means bone i make black and soft tissue i'll make gray or white so here there is a setting can just go in negative window and entire scan will reverse and then it's so easy to read the all the structures of the internal auditory matrix very clearly so here you can very clearly make out because what happens here negative means the bone will be removed the bone will disappear in this only soft tissue will remain so wherever was bone now see this was the petrous bone actually if i reverse it again see this bone the bone wherever it was bone all the bones will be deleted from the scan so just delete the bones from the scan what will remain the soft tissue structures so these canals are very nicely and prominently seen if you use this negative window technique while reading the internal auditory matrix specially so see here you are able to see internal auditory matrix very nicely you can see the labyrinthine segment you can see the turn of the cochlea so labyrinthine segment coming out of the internal auditory matrix then the superior vestibular nerve which is going towards the uh, <clears throat> vestibule then if you further go down you can see the cochlear nerve the cochlear nerve entering inside the cochlea and here with the help of this negative technique you can even see the inferior vestibular nerve also which was not very clear in the routine conventional scanning so here usually you can make out the diameter of the facial nerve the diameter of the superior vestibular nerve and the diameter of the cochlear nerve so you can say the cochlear nerve is almost the biggest in the all the nerves and then that offshoot also which was not very clearly seen if we increase the brightness here you'll be able to trace that even offshoot also you can just trace it this is the singular nerve and then you have to can just see here that singular nerve is going to supply the ampullary end of the posterior semicircular canal so with conventional window sometimes it becomes very difficult to identify but with the help of negative window it's very easy to find out and read the ct scan particularly of the internal auditory matrix then even facial nerve also we can trace with the negative window settings so see this was the labyrinthine segment the first genu the geniculate ganglion then the horizontal segment and then the vertical segment also down you can trace like this with the help of negative window technique so we saw the internal auditory matrix we saw all the four nerves along with the singular nerve actually what we saw are the canals for the nerves and not the actual nerves actual nerves we can make out more on the mri of the temporal bone the things what we saw are all the canals like this is the canal for the labyrinthine segment canal for the geniculate ganglion canal for the horizontal segment what we are seeing is the bone actually not not the soft tissue so this is the canal for the cochlear nerve so what we saw are the canals the actual nerves will be seen in the mri then we'll go next so facial nerve we saw then we'll come to the inner ear so again inner ear we have to imagine the 3d model internal auditory matrix i already covered in that now we'll see the semicircular canal vestibule cochlea vestibular aqueduct cochlear aqueduct oval window and the round window so this is the 3d model you have to imagine the anatomy of the temporal bone that the internal auditory matrix will be like this then anterior to the internal auditory matrix is the cochlea and posteriorly will be the vestibule and the semicircular canal so this is always a rule if you get any anomalous cases and you want to identify whether it is a part of cochlea or vestibule or semicircular canals you should always make internal auditory matrix as your reference line whatever part is anterior to internal auditory matrix is a cochlea whatever part is posterior to it is the semicircular canals and the vestibule so like this 
this is the internodular matters enter into this is cochlea and then posteriorly into the semicircular canals so this is again it is open more we will see that 3d model so here you can see this is the superior semicircular canal this is the lateral semicircular canal and this is the posterior semicircular canal so we know superior semicircular canal is divided into two parts the anterior part is the ampullary end and posterior part is non ampullary end so anterior part ampulla means a dilation basically ampulla by definition it means dilation so what will happen when you are going down then this part will dilate and i told you in the beginning that some structures are very easily identifiable in the scans when you see from top to bottom so semicircular canal is one of those structures so it's very easy to identify first the superior semicircular canal and then rest rest of the canals so if you trace this superior semicircular canal in the topmost third it will look like some tubular structure and then as your scan keeps going down the anterior end and posterior end will separate anterior end is ampullary end and posterior end is the non ampullary end so ampulla means it has to dilate means it will increase in the diameter and ultimately it will open inside the vestibule but what happens to the posterior end the posterior end is the non ampullary end it will receive non ampullary end of the posterior semicircular canal this non ampullary end of superior and posterior both will meet together they will form the common crust and which will ultimately open inside the vestibule then once you reach to the level of the vestibule you will get the lateral semicircular canal like some ring like structure you can see that is the lateral semicircular canal and this non ampullary end of the posterior semicircular canal has gone inside the common crust there will be another end opposite side which will be the ampullary end see there again you can see dilation so this dilation will be near the vestibule and ultimately it will open inside the vestibule so whatever happens all the semicircular canal irrespective whether it is the ampullary end or non ampullary end everything opens inside the vestibule and then it is easy to trace it from superior semicircular canal so we'll go in the topmost part of the ct scan so this is the topmost part you are seeing few air cells here then come down to form to find the tubular structure here so see tubular -like structure is coming in the picture so this is nothing but the superior semicircular canal and then once you get this tubular structure you have to just keep pressing it down then both the ends got separated the anterior ampullary end and posterior non ampullary end so by definition this ampullary end should increase in size in this this diameter should increase to call it as a ampullary end so now i'll go down still it is not dilating the diameter is same this zoom it little more so see the diameter is still same like this non ampullary end now i'm still going down diameter is still same diameter is still same just concentrate on anterior part only posterior part i'll come later so diameter is still same now you see there is a increase in this diameter this round is increasing in size now so this is nothing but the ampullary end of the superior semicircular canal and if you keep further go down it will open ultimately in the vestibule so this is still dilating and ultimately it has opened inside the vestibule so this is the vestibule so we formed the tubular structure that is the dome of the superior semicircular canal we traced it down where the anterior end and posterior end got separated anterior end means ampullary end it should increase in the diameter so here it started increasing in the diameter ultimately it has opened inside the vestibule so what happened to this non ampullary end so we we'll come back again this is tubular structure anterior posterior got separated now we'll forget about this we'll just concentrate on this non ampullary end so you are going down and you received the non ampullary end of the posterior semicircular canal so once you receive the non ampullary end of the posterior semicircular canal this part becomes common crust and then this common crust will traverse anteriorly so i'm going down again 
look at this structure only forget about this part because this is ampullary and we'll stress it later so concentrate on this part this much part only this part you have to concentrate just keep seeing it it's moving anteriorly it's moving anteriorly it's moving anteriorly and it is open inside the vestibule so that was the common thrust which ultimately gone inside the vestibule so the superior semicircular canal ampullary and non ampullary end we saw when we were tracing this common crust from how common crust form it is formed by the non ampullary end of the superior and non ampullary end of the posterior so this is non ampullary end of the posterior semicircular canal once you get this you just keep tracing this so that you will reach to the ampullary end of the posterior semicircular canal so i'll trace this opposite end now i'm going down going down going down 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 going down 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 now see there is again dilation here so this is the ampullary end of the posterior semicircular canal where we saw this singular nerve was coming from the singular foramen so i'll go to negative window again see here this is the ampullary end of the posterior semicircular canal the singular nerve is coming from the it is out uh, offshoot of the inferior vestibular nerve so here you got the ampullary end of the posterior semicircular canal also if you still go down it will vanish because vestibule is the higher level you have to come up so that you can see that it is going inside the vestibule so it went inside the vestibule so whatever opening we saw everything gone inside the vestibule and then when we came to this level we can see the lateral semicircular canal very nicely so this is called a signet ring appearance or bucket handle appearance of the lateral semicircular canal so all the semicircular canals we saw the dome of the superior then the anterior part is the ampullary it is dilated open inside the vestibule from there you can trace the ampullary end and non ampullary end of the lateral semicircular canal which is also opening inside the vestibule then this non ampullary end of the superior semicircular canal received non ampullary end of the posterior semicircular canal both merge together to form the common crust both got open inside the vestibule and during that time what happened this ampullary end is going down and here you can see the ampulla where your singular nerve is coming where your singular nerve came and then to trace it open it inside the vestibule so this is about the semicircular canals so next is the cochlea so all of us know if you see if you know the promontory promontory is nothing but the basal tongue of the cochlea so we'll go to cochlea so this is the cochlea all of us know structure so this is the cochlea <clears throat> yeah suppose take it as this is a right ear so you are seeing the tympanic membrane and then you will see a bulge in the middle ear the medial wall of the middle ear that is the basal tongue of the cochlea so if you get the basal tongue you can just keep pressing it up to get the middle and the apical tongue also so same thing you have to do here just see the bulge in the middle ear here you can see the promontory so promontory means nothing but the basal tongue of the cochlea then just keep pressing it up you will get the middle turn you will get the apical turn also just keep pressing it up this is the apical turn the middle turn the basal turn you can see the modulus also inside and then this is somewhere between the middle turn and the basal turn junction 
which are not exactly a part of middle turn also which is not exactly a part of basal turn also but somewhere in the junction which is in close approximation of the labyrinthine segment but literature wise most of the literature they mention that this is the basal turn of the cochlea but if you try to trace it it is not actually the complete basal turn it is the junction of the middle turn and the basal turn of the cochlea which is in close relation with this labyrinthine segment so means when the basal turn is picking up uh, middle turn that is the junction the part of the basal turn and middle turn which comes in close approximation here so again this is the promontory the basal turn the middle turn the apical turn again the apical turn middle turn and basal turn keep going up the apical turn this is the middle turn and the basal turn junction so this is about the from uh, cochlea then next we will come to vestibular aqueduct and cochlear aqueduct so i told you in the beginning there are three communications between the posterior fossa dura and the otic capsule the first we have already seen the first was the intranodular meatus so there is another communication between the posterior fossa dura to the otic capsule which goes to the round window actually so it's called the cochlear aqueduct so cochlear aqueduct will be exactly parallel to this intranodular meatus so you should not do anything just keep your arrow there and just keep pressing it down you'll get another structure which is coming out of posterior fossa dura see here this posterior fossa dura one small extension very thin extension is coming which is going towards the round window where it is going here will come your round window so it is going here here it is obliterated with both bulb and the bone only 17% cases it may reach up to the round window rest 83% of the cases it will obliterate in between somewhere here so cochlear aqueduct functions are not known but it is said that as it traverses towards the round window the function of the cochlear aqueduct is to dampen the pulsations of the posterior fossa to the round window otherwise continuously you keep hearing that dub 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 sound because if you have seen the posterior fossa dura it will be always pulsating because of the csf pressure inside so the function of cochlear aqueduct is said that it dampens the dural pulsation towards the round window but that is true in most only 17% cases where it can actually reach to the round window rest 83% of the cases it is either obliterated with this bone which is surrounding the cochlea the petrous part of bone it will get obliterated or it may be compressed with this jugular bulb so this is the second extension and third one i told you that it is the reverse extension it comes from the vestibule towards the posterior fossa dura that is called the vestibular aqueduct so this is the vestibule and this is the posterior fossa dura we have to find out communication between two so if you see here this is the vestibular aqueduct so you can see this is the communication between the posterior fossa dura and the otic capsule if you trace it up you can see it's going in the towards this floor of the common crust and then there it is entering inside the vestibule just change the window yeah, now you can see so it will go and trace the common crust so this was the non ampullary end of posterior superior semi circular canal non ampullary end of the posterior semi circular canal this forms the common crust you would trace it anteriorly and in the floor of the common crust this is the floor of the common crust you get this vestibular aqueduct and it is going and coming inside the posterior fossa dura so vestibular aqueduct is the bony channel bone bony channel is called vestibular aqueduct which will contain your endolymphatic duct so inside will be the endolymphatic duct but when you are seeing in the ct scan you should call it as vestibular aqueduct so on ct scan both the endolymphatic duct and vestibular aqueduct are same but vestibular aqueduct is a more proper nomenclature because it is showing you canal the content of vestibular aqueduct is the endolymphatic duct and then ultimately it will open inside the posterior fossa dura this is the area of the endolymphatic sac 
so if you are seeing these things in the mri you will tell it as endolymphatic duct and if you are seeing the same thing in the ct scan you will label it as vestibular aqueduct because vestibular aqueduct is the bony channel which contains endolymphatic duct which is a soft tissue dr nilesh yes, sir call question yeah. they asking uh, when do you call the vestibular aqueduct dilated in the ct yeah yeah that when that will come in pathologist sir now i am just ah, okay. uh, this one normal one okay so that i'll come sir okay okay boss so next we'll come to the oval window and round window so already we got to see the vestibule vestibule we have seen again we know that vestibule is not a 2d structure it is 3d structure it has a, a, you can say it is a room type of structure where in the roof it will have the internal auditory matrix so the floor of the internal auditory matrix is the vestibule you can say when you drill the internal auditory matrix at the roof you get the vestibule means the floor of the vestibule forms the upper margin of the internal auditory matrix so there are two parts of internal auditory matrix porous and fundus so you can remember as a pp and ff so porous means it is towards posterior fossa dura so this part is the porous of the internal auditory matrix and fundus means it is ff f means foot plate so the part which is towards the foot plate is the fundus of the uh, internal auditory matrix so the vestibule will be sitting at the upper margin of the fundus or you can say the floor of the vestibule forms the roof of the internal auditory matrix so this is the vestibule if you keep tracing it down you will get the foot plate so this is the foot plate and if you further go down the foot plate the part of vestibule the oval window and you go down you get the round window also so this is the promontory and this is the round window so you can see here round window and this was the promontory so round window if you trace it up you will get the foot plate if you trace it up it will be inside the vestibule then comes the sinuses so we know already this w sign so the medial one will be the sinus tympani and lateral will be the facial recess so this w is formed by the lateral part will be formed by the facial recess and medial part will be formed by the sinus tympani and in between will come the pyramid so if you trace this pyramid pyramid sh should show you the i change the window now stapedial tendon which will go and insert over the head of the stapes So if you trace this, this is the pyramid. You can see one small structure which is going towards the head of the stapes. So you can see this projection which is coming out of the pyramid. This is the stapedius muscle. So whatever is medial to this pyramid is the sinus tympani, and whatever lateral to it is the facial recess. So this is the facial recess pyramid and sinus tympani. then eustachian tube orifice medial end we saw in the nasopharynx here we'll see the lateral end so we'll come to the middle ear here. here you can see the eustachian tube orifice lateral end so if you know the anatomy the internal carotid canal it lies in the floor of the eustachian tube and there is one muscle which lies in the roof of the eustachian tube it is called tensor tympani so this is the tensor tympani muscle and this is the internal carotid artery so tensor tympani muscle if you trace just keep tracing it you can see it actually going towards the neck of the malleus so you can see here it takes acute turn and it gets inserted itself over the junction of the neck and head of the malleus so this is the area of the processus cochleariformis also so you can see the tendon which is attaching to the junction of neck can head of the malleus here in this particular scan it is going till neck only sometimes you may see it will be little higher up place but most of the time it will attach to the neck only neck of the malleus and sometimes partly over the head or the handle also few fibers may go up or down but majorityly it get attached to the neck of malleus so this is the tensor tympani tendon 
and this is tensor tympani muscle you can see it it is going in the roof of the eustachian tube so this is the roof of the eustachian tube this is the eustachian tube orifice and as facial nerve is having genu even internal carotid artery also have genu so we saw in the beginning it was just one comment dr nilesh yeah this is uh, show that picture no that's called the seagull appearance uh that uh, tim tensor tympani uh, yeah eustachian tube some more some more ah uh, this, this is called the seagull appearance see the two yeah. feet of the seagull and uh, yeah. this is the head of the seagull yeah yeah correct sir yes so the internal carotid artery we saw in the beginning it was in the jugular foramen so this is called as vertical part of the internal carotid artery also called as vertical petrous carotid so once you keep tracing this carotid up in the floor of the eustachian tube orifice it will take bend it will bend and it will become horizontal petrous carotid so this is the genu of the internal carotid artery and then it will become the horizontal internal carotid artery it's called horizontal petrous carotid and this is the vertical petrous carotid so we finish this so uh, then use of 3d mpr for coronal and sagittal section study so i told you any scan you can make it uh, any plane you can make it out uh to see the structures like uh, some mcqs are there like uh, snake eye appearance of the facial nerve then molar tooth appearance of the uh, inguinomalar joint or you can say polch plane for the superior semicircular canal dehiscence so everything you can make with the help of this softwares so what you can have to do so now if you ask what is the snake eye appearance of the facial nerve so facial nerve we are tracing in, in the axial cut so if you want to trace the same thing in the coronal cut you can just go to this 3d mpr make it coronal cut yeah, this is coronal cut and then keep the principle same you have to find out the internal auditory matrix somehow so go and find the internal auditory matrix so here you can see the internal auditory matrix so the internal auditory matrix you have to find and just you have to keep going anteriorly or posteriorly so if you come anteriorly the internal auditory matrix is vanished so go posteriorly and this is the internal auditory matrix and this is the labyrinthine segment and you can see this like a appearance of the bone window so you can make this like a appearance of the or cobra is appearance of the facial nerve it's in coronal cut so the medial part is the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve and lateral part is the tympanic part of facial nerve so with this 3d mpr you can make it out even this side it's more prominent here this is called snake eye appearance of the facial nerve where medial is the labyrinthine segment lateral is the tympanic segment so this we made with the use of 3d mpr the next is molar tooth appearance molar tooth appearance is seen in the sagittal cut not in the axial or coronal cut so we will go back to our uh, or else in this only you can go to 3d mpr it go to axial cut keep your cursor over the im joint is that uh, what we saw in the beginning over the ice cream cone appearance so i'll keep my cursor over the ice cream cone appearance so this is ice cream cone appearance in the axial cut which is formed by the head of malleus body of incus short process of incus if you change the plane to the sagittal so i'll go now i'll see how it is seen in sagittal this is the sagittal cut just zoom it so see in sagittal cut if you see it looks like a molar tooth so it is called molar tooth appearance of the im joint where it is formed by the head and body of the incus so if you see in sagittal cut im joint it is molar tooth appearance if you see in the axial cut it is ice cream cone appearance then comes your superior semicircular canal so we we'll go up we we'll go to the dome of the superior semicircular canal so this is the dome of superior semicircular canal 
if you want to make poles plane you have to rotate the planes so just keep your cursors in the superior semi circular canal dome and rotate this you have to just rotate it is like this and go and see it in sagittal cut so this is the sagittal cut here you can see the poles plane you can see there is no deviations in the superior semi circular canal bone is totally intact so you can change your uh, planes with the help of this softwares that is the importance of seeing the cd and using the softwares suppose sometimes if you feel now see here uh, we'll see both the sides whether it is symmetrical or not this scan can say it's uh, almost symmetrical but the slight difference is there it's almost symmetrical or a slight difference is there because if you see here here uh, middle turn is also coming into the picture basal turn is already seen here only basal turn is seen uh, so slight rotation is there so even this and here you can see the entire ice cream cone is seen and here ice cream cone is not formed so what has happened this is little tilted scan so this correction also you can you uh, can do using your 3d ampere so again go to this coronal uh, sorry uh, yeah coronal and try to rotate this so that both the ice cream cone should be looking similar to each other i'll do this this keep it uh, in the center go to coronal yeah now what is your aim you have to turn this axis such a way that both the ice cream cone should be seen similar so i'll just turn see here can you make out it's just just one side is rotating other side is not rotating yeah yeah so, we can see yeah so the ice cream cone you have to match perfectly slightly yeah now it is perfect match of each other the ice cream cone so this became the exact replica of each other the exact scan at that level so like this if uh, scan is rotated too much one side you can correct it using this software also the next is cone beam cone beam we all know that radiation will be less and uh, soft tissue differentiation will be more but it's a matter of practice which can you keep seeing more so i'll just show you one cone beam how it looks uh, if you are more seeing the conventional scan so sometimes cone beam you will be finding difficult to understand if you see more of cone bp a cone beam ct scan then you will find the conventional scan little difficult to understand so that is a matter of practice which can you see more opening it's got stuck sir here i have finished almost uh, the normal uh, radiology of temporal bone sir any questions on that yeah yeah uh, take another uh, half an hour to tell about something about pathologist sir half an hour i require no no uh, i think i think we'll take a break of 5 minutes because yeah. everybody is a uh, sure sir uh, yeah you have over saturated with uh, this one the information yeah yeah, yeah. so you you stop you you finished uh, your uh, this one yeah this is normal is okay finished. stop sharing now yeah okay now what we will do is uh, yeah we will take a small break of around 5 minutes uh, go for tea and come back it's around 325 yeah uh, we'll come by around 3:35 yeah uh 10 minutes break and then yes. what we'll do is we'll start with pathology yes and uh, there's also some questions about relationship of the semicircular canal with the facial nerve and all okay we'll, we'll discuss that later 
Yeah. From 335, uh, we will discuss for you were talking about half an hour, is it? Half an hour for yeah, half an hour. I'll finish pathology, sir. And in that, I'll uh, include MRI also, sir, because some pathologies require MRI correlation also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, so uh, from 335 to 435, we'll have one hour. Yeah, yeah. One hour is more than sufficient. Sir. One hour we'll have. One Second hour we'll have. More pathologies. Yes. So we can discuss more pathology. I can. Yeah. Uh, we can even go for two hours, boss. No problem. Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> okay. One of the best. Uh, see, I have heard uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, Temple Bone uh, CT uh, presentations all over the world. But I think this is the best I have heard so far. There is no yes, doubt yes, about yes, it. Sir. And the audience will realize it when they see it on the YouTube. This is available on Royal Pearl ENT University um, channel. And uh, this is purely educational. And uh, we'll be calling experts to do such uh, programs. I'm sure Nilesh is the expert in reading CD Temple Bone. Uh, I, I'm very, very, very uh, convinced. So uh, I'm just going to uh, mute myself, put my video on uh, this one. Go have tea, uh, Dr. Nilesh. You've been talking yeah. for two and a half hours continuously. You've talked so nice. <laughs> and another one hour or two hours we need from you. Yes. And then we'll come back. Thank you, yes. Dr. Nilesh. Sure, sir. We'll yeah. The same, same link. We'll come in the same link. Yes. Uh, at our, now it's 3.30, 3.40, we'll come back. Yeah, yeah. Fine, sir. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir.